Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn about one of the important gastrointestinal infections and the objectives of this lesson are that at the end of the lesson, you all will be able to learn and understand this important infection and the pathogen causing it and how do we go about the lab diagnosis of this particular infection. To meet the lesson objectives, the contents will be discussed under the following headings by taking an example of a case workup. Let us begin the discussion of the case what we came across. It was early summer last year, we had a girl by name Gauri, she was three and a half year old and she was brought to the hospital by her parents for the complaints of diarrhea, fever and crampy abdominal pain which lasted for more than two days. It so happened that symptoms really got aggravated and that was a time when the parents got her to the hospital for the child becoming irritable, toxic and she also had reduced urine output. We took the detailed history from the parents. Parents actually told us that Gauri was going to a daycare center and one day they had the call from the daycare center. They said that Gauri is really not keeping well and the parents brought her back home. Initially, the whole illness started with watery diarrhea which turned to be bloody and the frequency of motions was more than 8 times per day. She also had tenismus that means the Gauri had a very severe abdominal pain. The meaning of tenismus here is that Tenismus is a severe abdominal pain associated with feeling of evacuating the bowels in spite of bowels not being full really. Gauri was not exposed to any outside food. She did not have any travel to other place in the recent past. One important thing here in the history to be noted is that daycare center also had children who suffered from the same kind of symptoms which was told to us by the parents. So, what do you think is it a case of diarrhea or dysentery? It is rather important to discuss here what is the meaning of diarrhea and dysentery. Of course, here it goes more in favor of dysentery because as per the definition of dysentery, dysentery is a condition wherein there is infective disease of the large bowels which is characterized by frequent passing of blood and mucus in the stool. Rather, there is less of a stool, more of mucus and blood along with severe abdominal cramps or pain. There are different bacteria as well as parasite which can cause dysentery. We call it as the bacillary dysentery and parasitic dysentery respectively. It is also important to differentiate whether condition is being caused by bacteria or by parasites, it is also important to know the group of bacteria which can lead to such a condition. The important ones being Shigella species and Ischgrisia coli. Ischgrisia coli and Shigella, they are members of Enterobacteriaceae family and both of them also produce a similar kind of toxin that is called as a Shiga toxin. Ischgrisia coli, one of them STEC meaning Shigella toxin producing Ischgrisia coli and the other two EHEC and EHEC are the ones which can also result into similar condition, EHEC being enterohemorrhagic E. coli, enteroinvasive E. coli. 
The others are Campylobacter, Salmonella species and Vibrio parahemolyticus. The parasites can also cause dysentery. The important ones being Entamoeba histolytica, Giardia lamblia and others. In case of Gauri, we really suspect it to be bacillary dysentery and the clinical diagnosis was also the bacillary dysentery because there were supportive clinical findings going more in favor of the bacillary dysentery. For this to differentiate, we need to really know what are the clinical differences and the laboratory finding wise differences between the bacillary dysentery and the parasitic dysentery. The points in favor of Gauri's case are that whole episode started very abruptly. Initially it was watery diarrhea, very soon it turned to be the bloody diarrhea. The stools were scanty in nature and they were non-offensive odor. There was a tenismus which was very much evident in this case and she also complained of diffuse abdominal pain. Some of these points are really different if you consider the amoebic dysentery that is why it is important to know the differences between the bacillary dysentery and amoebic dysentery clinically so that we go in the right direction in the patient treatment. That is why laboratory diagnosis is essential to confirm the etiology whether it is a bacillary or parasitic dysentery so that we can target the pathogen very specifically and also this will help us to take measures for control and prevention of the disease. Likewise, what we did here was we collected the stool sample from this patient and it was sent to the laboratory. Sometimes if we expect the delay in transferring these specimen to the microbiology laboratory, then it is essential that we need to collect specimen in the transport media. The transport medium which is commonly used when we suspect bacillary dysentery is either GN broth or the Sachs buffered glycerol saline. Especially the Sachs buffered glycerol saline is going to support the organisms in the log phase of the bacterial growth so that these organisms can survive for a little longer time otherwise they would be easily killed by the presence of other commensal bacteria which rather convert the pH into more of acidic side and acidic pH is really detrimental to the Shigella organisms which are quite delicate pathogens. On arrival of the sample in the laboratory, we had various modules to establish the diagnosis. First important thing was the gross examination. Then we went into microscopy, we cultured it and then we also did some serological test for confirming the etiology. The gross examination was performed on receival. As the stool appears here, it is bright red in color and also mixed with some mucus flakes. Rather, this specimen had almost nil fecal matter itself. It was more of a blood and more of mucus material. It was odorless and pH of this particular specimen was alkaline. Then we went into the saline preparation, we subjected the specimen to microscopy and in the microscopy we could see plenty of pus cells and we also saw non-motile bacteria. Otherwise in a stool we see a large number of motile organisms, we also appreciated some RBCs. Sometimes we can even appreciate the macrophages, macrophages appear here as ghost cells. They are called as ghost cells because they engulf some of the RBCs present and they appear as the ghost cells. Especially the gross examination and the microscopic findings gave a lot of clue for us to call this case as the bacillary dysentery. Likewise, we communicated to the treating physician immediately within 10 to 15 minutes and we said that it is a case of bacillary dysentery. As we considered this clinical condition here, uh, Gauri was toxic and she was uh, irritable, also had a large amount of passage of stools which, uh, which had led to more of a dehydration. Physician, it was very apt for him to start the antibiotic therapy, oral and IV rehydration. Ciprofloxacin was given in this case and really she started 
responding very well to this treatment. Now, next step was to grow this organism. As I said, there are similar other group of bacteria which could be causing the condition. So, we actually had to go for isolation of causative agent plus identification of agent so that we would be targeting the pathogen with right antibiotic. Before we did that, it is really important to understand what is the morphology or the cultural characters of this organism so that again it becomes easy for us to choose the specific culture media plus it will help us to identify the organism by its biochemical reactions. Let us now study about the morphology of Shigella species. The Shigella organisms as we are seeing here are the gram negative bacilli. They look pink, so tiny short bacilli of the size of 2 to 4 micrometer by 0 0.6 micrometer. They grow on ordinary media and they are facultative anaerobes. That means, they are ok with or without the presence of air. They are actually non-motile, they are non-flagellated organisms. They are non-sporing, not capsulated as well. They are classified into four different groups. Shigella species is actually named after the scientist who first time discovered them by name Shiga. Organisms belong to the family Enterobacteriaceae. The tribe Shigellae is further divided into species based on O antigen present on their cell wall. The type A group has major pathogen that is the Shigella dysentery, which is also known to cause very severe form of Shigellosis. It has got 15 different subgroups. Similarly, we have type B, C and D. In B, the example is Shigella flexneri, type C Shigella boidi and Shigella soni. It is also important to understand the physiological characters of this organism. As I uh, already said, these are gram negative bacilli and non motile and non H2S producing. These three points really help us to differentiate this particular organism from its very close cousin that is Salmonella species. They are catalase positive, catalase is positive except for Shigella dysentery. Similarly, it does not ferment lactose, but again an exception here is Shigella soni which is the late lactose fermenter. That means, it can ferment the lactose sugar if we incubate this organism for more than 48 hours. Mannitol sugar is similarly fermented by others except Shigella dysentery type 1. In fact, we can divide the Shigella organisms based on their mannitol fermentation capability as well. So, these are some of the physiological characters of Shigella species which will really help us to differentiate the species. Now, to grow the organisms, we need to select a group of selective media because the specimen what we receive is stool sample which is supposed to contain all other commensals and we are not interested to grow the other commensals, but to target at only the pathogens. To do that, we have group of selective media. The first and the most commonly used medium is the McConkey agar. McConkey agar is moderately selective medium which actually has got bile salts. It will inhibit the growth of gram positives and the other commensals whereas, it will allow the growth of pathogens. And other two highly selective media for Salmonella shigella are XLD agar and BCA agar. We chose these three media for growing organisms and we inoculated the specimen onto these media and incubated at 37 degrees centigrade for overnight's time. On the next day morning, we observed that there were translucent non-lactose fermenting colonies on McConkey agar as well as on XLD. We grew the red colored colonies on DCA agar without any black center. It is important to know that Salmonella also grows on this medium produces the similar colonies. Only difference is that Salmonella will have a black center because it can produce H2S. Now, to confirm identity, we took one of the colony, we made the smear and stained by grams and we found gram negative short bacilli. They were also tested for their motility by hanging drop and found to be non-motile. These two points are going in favor of Shigella species because they are gram negative, non-motile, non-H2S non producing 
non lactose fermenting colonies further to confirm them we did some of the biochemical reactions the catalase test was found to be positive lactose was found to be negative they produced non lactose fermenting colonies on McConkie agar and the XLD agar the mannitol was fermented methyl red was positive and the Vogue's Prosker turned to be negative and H2S of course was not produced. These are some of the other points which helped us to consolidate as the Shigella species. Some more biochemicals which supported our finding are indole test which is known to be variable as I said the whole group of Shigella organisms are known to give variable reaction citrate is negative by all of them and the urease test is also negative by all of them. Coming to the TSI reaction which is very important confirm the identity. The TSI medium is a composite medium containing 3 sugars ability of the organism to ferment one or more sugars it will produce the color change as completely the acidic slant and acidic but what we are seeing here is the slant is pink in color that is alkaline in reaction and the butt or the lower part of this medium is no change this is the original color of the medium. So, the reaction is recorded as K by A that means alkaline by acidic. This particular reaction is also very important and again it is going in favor of Shigella species because Shigella will not ferment lactose sugar. One important thing can note down in this medium is the production of H2S. There is no streak of H2S produced here which usually happens in case of Salmonella typhi as I said that is a close cousin of Shigella species. So, these are some of the important reaction what we need to remember and then we moved ahead we did the antibiotic sensitivity testing. Antibiotic sensitivity testing is rather important especially because the Shigella species earlier were known to be sensitive to most of the antibiotics, but of late they are developing resistance to one or more drugs especially those who are international travelers. Actually as I said Gauri was treated with ciprofloxacin our aim was to test her isolate first of all with this particular drug and we were fortunate to get this as sensitive identity of our report was communicated to the physician and continued the same treatment. We could also confirm identity of the isolate by doing latex agglutination test as I said after 48 hours we could communicate identity of the organism to the physician along with the antibiotic sensitivity report and the physician was happy parents were happy that she was already responding very well to the treatment. By doing right kind of approach for lab diagnosis we could save Gauri from lot of fatal complications especially are known to happen in the children below 5 years. The complications can be arthritis to severe toxemia and death. One of the important complication in children is the intussusception because some part of the intestine could be paralyzed and this part of the paralyzed intestine could be taken over by the peristaltic movement of the rest of the intestines and result in the intussusception. So, we could save her from all these uh, deadly complications. Microangiopathy would result especially when it happens in the kidney it is called as the hemolytic uremic syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome could also be produced by the Ischgrisia coli which I was discussing in the etiology. So, with this case workup we have now covered some of the contents of our lesson we are left with some more points now we will go into that. Let us now study some of the epidemiological points related to this disease as I said this disease is common in children it is quite common in the daycare setting in the nursing homes in the crowded and more compact areas schools etcetera. The infections by Shigella dysentriae are supposed to be very severe compared to those by flexnery or by Shigella sony and others. Infection with Shigella dysentriae is found to be more common in the tropical countries. The western countries we come across more of Shigella sony and Shigella sony is known to cause a milder disease as compared to Shigella dysentriae. Mortality in shigellosis can go up to 20 percent because of toxemia and other complications as I listed in untreated cases it is as high as 20 percent. 
as i said antibiotic resistance is now emerging it is important to know their antibiotic susceptibility so that we can treat specifically such diseases the source of this infections are not the carriers but they are the patients themselves there are no animal reservoirs humans are the only source transmission can be direct transmission from man to man which usually happens between the children in the school or in the day care center or it could be indirect transmission we can remember four f's that is food flies feces and the fingers other than that taps flush handles and fomites can also help in transmission of the disease it is very very important to know and remember that 10 200 bacilli can cause a disease they are highly pathogenic and once they enter they have to cause the disease that is the reason that we can never find shigella in our intestine as a commensal mode of infection is by fecal oral route the incubation period ranges between 2 to 5 days one good news about this disease is that it is self limiting that is the reason that we don't see much of a chronic carrier state in this if we recover some shigella organisms from any person that means there is some pathology behind it cannot be a commensal in the gut at all now coming to the virulence factors what are those factors which are really making it so pathogenic shigella is said to have double edged sword that means it has the capacity to invade it also has a capacity to secrete a very strong potent toxin called as a shiga toxin let us see how this works organism though said to be non motile it is even more stronger than being not motile shigella will act on m cells they invade them by macropenocytosis and also start spreading to the neighboring cells by basolateral sides of the epithelial cells next what they do is they polymerize the actin fiber so that actin filaments are going to help in transfer of these organisms to the neighboring cells they cannot cross a certain limit there because there are some patches of immune cells i will show you in the next slide where get themselves limited and that is where they start spreading to the side and as a result they produce shallow ulcers they are engulfed by the macrophages these organisms will cause apoptotic death in macrophages and that is how they avoid the immune action on themselves so we have talked now about how they can invade how they can evade the immune action on themselves this is one of the very strong armor the next thing is as i said it is a double edged sword it is not only going to invade but it will also release a lot of toxin the toxins are of two types it releases endotoxin and the exotoxin which is very strong called as a shiga toxin it has got a and b filaments a is for action and b is for binding the a part of the toxin it is supposed to initiate the pathogenesis what it does is it is going to inhibit the protein synthesis in the cell whichever it is attacking and ultimately if there is no protein synthesis in the cell there is going to be cell death and many cells dying together will result into tissue necrosis and formation of ulcers so this is how actually pathogenesis sets now let us see the same series of events in a diagrammatic fashion first let us see how it invades our epithelial cells these are the epithelial cells and especially the m cells in the epithelium they are going to target once they bind to the epithelial surface there are receptors to receive them especially on the m cells this is the binding step with the help of of course the b fraction of toxin which i had shown you now what happens is micro pinocytosis the m cells are going to receive this organism and some of them uh, succeed in entering the cell next is they will not keep quiet they go on multiplying and this is a time they also are going to be engulfed by the macrophages and they start multiplying inside the macrophages you can observe here some of the filaments which have got attached to these organisms these are the actin fibers these fibers help the organism invade sidewise 
one more thing you need to note down here is that they are going to limit themselves to the submucosa and very very rarely up to muscularis mucosa because there are patches of immune pockets over here which the organisms are scared of they stop at this point because they know that if they move over here they will be killed so they start moving sideways till now the organism has taken the advantage of the capability to invade and also a plasmid mediated virulence factor which has helped it to reach to this level now once groundwork it has done it is going to multiply and release the toxins these red triangles we are seeing here are the toxins the toxin is now going to act on the intestinal epithelium act on the 60s ribosomal part of the protein synthesis which is going to result into the cell death not only that it is also going to interfere with the absorption of water and electrolytes when the water and electrolyte absorption is deranged it is going to result into lot of fluid loss as well as there will be microangio damage and bleeding that is the reason we see lot of tissue necrosis in the form of pus mucus etc and we also see the fresh blood because of uh, shallow ulcers and bleed from the ulcers ultimately results in extensive tissue damage and dysentric type of stools so the damage here is more by the toxins rather than if you compare amebiasis the damage there is more caused by the parasites themselves whereas here it is a toxin mediated damage that is the reason we get a diffuse abdominal pain not pointed to one area like in amebiasis it is a kind of a different scenario here so ultimately the shigella are going to invade our cells also uh, they are going to produce toxins so it is like a double edged sword we have understood the pathogenicity its virulence factors let us now talk about treatment treatment as i said is really not needed in regular cases we can relax because it is a self limiting disease unless the patient shows any kind of signs and symptoms of complications it is there is no need to treat ciprofloxacin is the drug of choice other drugs can also be tried as i said uh, nowadays it is better to give antibiotics it is mainly because we need to eliminate the multiplying bacteria if we treat them with antibiotics the antibiotics will target the bacteria when the bacteria die there is no more secretion of uh, toxins that is how we can control the whole episode rather than waiting it will also reduce the whole course of illness and it will also prevent complications and it will further reduce the transmission because humans are the only source of bacteria of course other than this we need to first give the oral and if needed iv fluid replacement that is also really going to work like a boon in such cases this is about the treatment of shigellosis how do we prevent the disease we need to as far as possible isolate the patients strict hand washing practices should be followed especially in case of day care settings and nursing homes primary schools we need to take care disinfect the taps and especially in the day care settings do not allow caretakers of the children to actually work in the kitchen because they change the diapers they may not really take care of their hygiene they would contaminate the food and drink that would result in another epidemic that is a reason we need to be careful especially when children are around this is about the prevention i think i have covered all the points in this class which i set out in the beginning by learning about the disease about the organism and its lab diagnosis i think we have achieved the lesson objectives and covered the contents before i wind up take home points shigellosis is common in children especially in the tropical countries shigella dysentery causes more severe disease there are certain characters of this organism we need to remember they are non motile gram negative bacilli non h2s producers and non lactose fermenters the disease luckily is a self limiting type and only fluid replacement will help in most of the cases however in case we suspect any more toxemia or complication there is a need to treat them with specific antibiotics these are some of the references the pictures i have used in the lessons thank you